The Seven Voyages of Sinbad the Sailor From the Arabian Nights by Andrew Lang In the times of the Caliph Harun al-Rashid, there lived in Baghdad a poor porter named Hinbad, who on a very hot day was sent to carry a heavy load from one end of the city to the other. Before he had accomplished half the distance, he was so tired that, finding himself in a quiet street where the pavement was sprinkled with rose water and a cool breeze was blowing, he set his burden upon the ground and sat down to rest in the shade of a grand house. Very soon, he decided that he could not have chosen a pleasanter place. A delicious perfume of aloes wood and pastilles came from the open windows and mingled with the scent of the rose water which steamed up from the hot pavement. Within the palace he heard some music, as of many instruments cunningly played, and the melodious warble of nightingales and other birds, and by this and the appetizing smell of many dainty dishes of which he presently became aware, he judged that feasting and merry-making were going on. He wondered who lived in this magnificent house, which he had never seen before, the street in which it stood being one which he seldom had occasion to pass. To satisfy his curiosity, he went up to some splendidly dressed servants who stood at the door, and asked one of them the name of the master of the mansion. What? replied he. Do you live in Baghdad and not know that here lives the noble Sinbad the sailor, that famous traveller who sailed over every sea upon which the sun shines? The porter, who had often heard people speak of the immense wealth of Sinbad, could not help feeling envious of one whose lot seemed to be as happy as his own was miserable. Casting his eyes up to the sky, he exclaimed aloud, Consider, mighty creator of all things, the differences between Sinbad's life and mine. Every day I suffer a thousand hardships and misfortunes, and have hard work to get even enough bad barley bread to keep myself and my family alive, while the lucky Sinbad spends money right and left and lives upon the fat of the land. What has he done that you should give him this pleasant life? What have I done? to deserve so hard a fate. So saying, he stamped upon the ground like one beside himself with misery and despair. Just at this moment, a servant came out of the palace and, taking him by the arm, said, Come with me. The noble Sinbad, my master, wishes to speak to you. Hinbad was not a little surprised at this summons, and feared that his unguarded words might have drawn upon him the displeasure of Sinbad. So he tried to excuse himself upon the pretext that he could not leave the burden which had been entrusted to him in the street. However, the lackey promised him that it should be taken care of, and urged him to obey the call so pressingly that at last the porter was obliged to yield. He followed the servant into a vast room, where a great company was seated round a table, covered with all sorts of delicacies. In the place of honour sat a tall, grave man, whose long white beard gave him a venerable air. Beside his chair stood a crowd of attendants, eager to minister to his wants. This was the famous Sinbad himself. The porter, more than ever alarmed at the sight of so much magnificence, tremblingly saluted the noble company. Sinbad, making a sign to him to approach, caused him to be seated at his right hand, and himself heaped choice morsels upon his plate, and poured out for him a draught of excellent wine, and presently, when the banquet drew to a close, spoke to him familiarly, asking him his name and occupation. My lord, replied the porter, I am called Hinbad. I am glad to see you here continued Sinbad, and I will answer for the rest of the company that they are equally pleased. But I wish you to tell me what it was that you said just now in the street. For Sinbad, passing by the open window before the feast began, had heard his complaint, and therefore had sent for him. 
At this question, Hindbad was covered with confusion, and hanging down his head, replied, My lord, I confess that, overcome by weariness and ill-humour, I uttered indiscreet words, which I pray you to pardon me. Oh, replied Sinbad, do not imagine that I am so unjust as to blame you. On the contrary, I understand your situation and can pity you. Only you appear to be mistaken about me, and I wish to set you right. You doubtless imagine that I have acquired all the wealth and luxury that you see me enjoy without difficulty or danger. But this is far indeed from being the case. I have only reached this happy state after having for years suffered every possible kind of toil and danger. Yes, my noble friends, he continued, addressing the company. I assure you that my adventures have been strange enough to deter even the most avaricious men from seeking wealth by traversing the seas. Since you have, perhaps, heard but confused accounts of my seven voyages and the dangers and wonders that I have met with by sea and land, I will now give you a full and true account of them, which I think you will be well pleased to hear. As Sinbad was relating his adventures chiefly on account of the porter, he ordered, before beginning his tale, that the burden which had been left in the street should be carried by some of his own servants to the place for which Hinbad had set out at first, while he remained to listen to the story. First Voyage I had inherited considerable wealth from my parents, and being young and foolish, I at first squandered it recklessly upon every kind of pleasure. But presently, finding that riches speedily take to themselves wings if managed as badly as I was managing mine, and remembering also that to be old and poor is misery indeed, I began to bethink me of how I could make the best of what still remained to me. I sold all my household goods by public auction, and joined a company of merchants who traded by sea, embarking with them at Balsora in a ship which we had fitted out between us. We set sail, and took our course towards the East Indies by the Persian Gulf, having the coast of Persia upon our left hand, and upon our right the shores of Arabia Felix. I was at first much troubled by the uneasy motion of the vessel, but speedily recovered my health, and since that hour have been no more plagued by seasickness. From time to time we landed at various islands, where we sold or exchanged our merchandise, and one day, when the wind dropped suddenly, we found ourselves becalmed close to a small island like a green meadow, which only rose slightly above the surface of the water. Our sails were furled, and the captain gave permission to all who wished to land for a while and amuse themselves. I was among the number, but when, after strolling about for some time, we lighted a fire and sat down to enjoy the repast which we had brought with us, we were startled by a sudden and violent trembling of the island, while at the same moment those left upon the ship set up an outcry bidding us come on board for our lives, since what we had taken for an island was nothing but the back of a sleeping whale. Those who were nearest to the boat threw themselves into it, others sprang into the sea, but before I could save myself, the whale plunged suddenly into the depths of the ocean, leaving me clinging to a piece of the wood which we had brought to make our fire. Meanwhile, a breeze had sprung up, and in the confusion that ensued on board our vessel in hoisting the sails and taking up those who were in the boat and clinging to its sides, no one missed me, and I was left at the mercy of the waves. All that day I floated up and down, now beaten this way, now that, and when night fell I despaired for my life. But, weary and spent as I was, I clung to my frail support, and great was my joy when the morning light showed me that I had drifted against an island. The cliffs were high and steep, but luckily for me some tree roots protruded in places, and by their aid I climbed up at last 
and stretched myself upon the turf at the top, where I lay, more dead than alive, till the sun was high in the heavens. By that time I was very hungry, but after searching I came upon some eatable herbs and a spring of clear water, and much refreshed I set out to explore the island. Presently I reached a great plain where a grazing horse was tethered, and as I stood looking at it I heard voices talking apparently underground, and in a moment a man appeared and asked me how I came upon the island. I told him my adventures, and heard in return that he was one of the grooms of Mirage, the king of the island, and that each year they came to feed their master's horses in this plain. He took me to a cave where his companions were assembled, and when I had eaten of the food they set before me, they bade me think myself fortunate to have come upon them when I did, since they were going back to their master on the morrow, and without their aid I could certainly never have found my way to the inhabited part of the island. Early the next morning we accordingly set out, and when we reached the capital I was graciously received by the king, to whom I related my adventures, upon which he ordered that I should be well cared for and provided with such things as I needed. Being a merchant, I sought out men of my own profession, and particularly those who came from foreign countries, as I hoped in this way to hear news from Baghdad and find out some means of returning thither, for the capital was situated upon the seashore and visited by vessels from all parts of the world. In the meantime, I heard many curious things and answered many questions concerning my own country, for I talked willingly with all who came to me. Also, to while away the time of waiting, I explored a little island named Cassel, which belonged to King Mirage, and which was supposed to be inhabited by a spirit named Degial. Indeed, the sailors assured me that often at night the playing of timbals could be heard upon it. However, I saw nothing strange upon my voyage, saving some fish that were full two hundred cubits long, but were unfortunately more in dread of us than even we were of them, and fled from us if we did but strike upon a board to frighten them. Other fishes there were only a cubit long, which had heads like owls. One day after my return, as I went down to the quay, I saw a ship which had just cast anchor and was discharging her cargo, while the merchants to whom it belonged were busily directing the removal of it to their warehouses. Drawing nearer, I presently noticed that my own name was marked upon some of the packages, and after having carefully examined them, I felt sure that they were indeed those which I had put on board our ship at Balsora. I then recognized the captain of the vessel, but as I was certain that he believed me to be dead, I went up to him and asked who owned the packages that I was looking at. There was on board my ship, he replied a merchant of Baghdad named Sinbad. One day he and several of my other passengers landed upon what we supposed to be an island, but which was really an enormous whale floating asleep upon the waves. No sooner did it feel upon its back the heat of the fire which had been kindled than it plunged into the depths of the sea. Several of the people who were upon it perished in the waters, and among others this unlucky Sinbad. This merchandise is his, but I have resolved to dispose of it for the benefit of his family, if I should ever chance to meet with them. Captain, said I, I am that Sinbad whom you believe to be dead, and these are my possessions. When the captain heard these words, he cried out in amazement, Lack a day, and what is the world coming to? In these days there is not an honest man to be met with. Did I not with my own eyes see Sinbad drown, and now you have the audacity to tell me that you are he? I should have taken you to be a just man, and yet for the sake of obtaining that which does not belong to you, you are ready to invent this horrible falsehood. Have patience, and do me the favour to hear my story, said I. Speak then, replied the captain, I'm all attention. So I told him of my escape, and of my fortunate meeting with the king's grooms, 
and how kindly I had been received at the palace. Very soon I began to see that I had made some impression upon him, and after the arrival of some of the other merchants, who showed great joy at once more seeing me alive, he declared that he also recognized me. Throwing himself upon my neck, he exclaimed, Heaven be praised that you have escaped from so great a danger. As to your goods, I pray you take them and dispose of them as you please. I thanked him and praised his honesty, begging him to accept several bales of merchandise in token of my gratitude, but he would take nothing. Of the choicest of my goods, I prepared a present for King Mirage, who was at first amazed, having known that I had lost my all. However, when I had explained to him how my bales had been miraculously restored to me, he graciously accepted my gifts, and in return gave me many valuable things. I then took leave of him, and exchanging my merchandise for sandal and aloes wood, camphor, nutmegs, cloves, pepper and ginger, I embarked upon the same vessel, and traded so successfully upon our homeward voyage that I arrived in Balsora with about one hundred thousand sequins. My family received me with as much joy as I felt upon seeing them once more. I bought land and slaves, and built a great house in which I resolved to live happily, and in the enjoyment of all the pleasures of life, to forget my past sufferings. Here Sinbad paused, and commanded the musicians to play again, while the feasting continued until evening. When the time came for the porter to depart, Sinbad gave him a purse containing one hundred sequins, saying, Take this, Hinbad, and go home, but tomorrow come again, and you shall hear more of my adventures. The porter retired, quite overcome by so much generosity, and you may imagine that he was well received at home, where his wife and children thanked their lucky stars that he had found such a benefactor. The next day, Hinbad, dressed in his best, returned to the voyager's house and was received with open arms. As soon as all the guests had arrived, the banquet began as before, and when they had feasted long and merrily, Sinbad addressed them thus. My friends, I beg that you will give me your attention while I relate the adventures of my second voyage, which you will find even more astonishing than the first. Second Voyage I had resolved, as you know, on my return from my first voyage, to spend the rest of my days quietly in Baghdad, but very soon I grew tired of such an idle life, and longed once more to find myself upon the sea. I procured, therefore, such goods as were suitable for the places I intended to visit, and embarked for the second time in a good ship with other merchants whom I knew to be honourable men. We went from island to island, often making excellent bargains, until one day we landed at a spot which, though covered with fruit trees and abounding in springs of excellent water, appeared to possess neither houses nor people. While my companions wandered here and there gathering flowers and fruit, I sat down in a shady place, and having heartily enjoyed the provisions and the wine I had brought with me, I fell asleep, lulled by the murmur of a clear brook which flowed close by. How long I slept I know not, but when I opened my eyes and started to my feet, I perceived with horror that I was alone and that the ship was gone. I rushed to and fro like one distracted, uttering cries of despair, and when from the shore I saw the vessel under full sail, just disappearing upon the horizon, I wished bitterly enough that I had been content to stay at home in safety. But since wishes could do me no good, I presently took courage and looked about me for a means of escape. When I had climbed a tall tree, I first of all directed my anxious glances towards the sea, but finding nothing hopeful there, I turned landward, and my curiosity was excited by a huge, dazzling white object, so far off that I could not make out what it might be. Descending from the tree, I hastily collected what remained of my provisions and set off as fast as I could go towards it. 
As I drew near, it seemed to me to be a white ball of immense size and height, and when I could touch it, I found it marvellously smooth and soft. As it was impossible to climb it, for it presented no foothold, I walked round about it, seeking some opening, but there was none. I counted, however, that it was at least fifty paces round. By this time the sun was near setting, but quite suddenly it fell dark. Something like a huge black cloud came swiftly over me, and I saw with amazement that it was a bird of extraordinary size which was hovering near. Then I remembered that I had often heard the sailors speak of a wonderful bird called a roc, and it occurred to me that the white object which had so puzzled me must be its egg. Sure enough, the bird settled slowly down upon it, covering it with its wings to keep it warm, and I cowered close beside the egg in such a position that one of the bird's feet, which was as large as the trunk of a tree, was just in front of me. Taking off my turban, I bound myself securely to it with the linen in the hope that the rock, when it took flight next morning, would bear me away with it from the desolate island. And this was precisely what did happen. As soon as the dawn appeared, the bird rose into the air, carrying me up and up till I could no longer see the earth, and then suddenly it descended so swiftly that I almost lost consciousness. When I became aware that the rock had settled, and that I was once again upon solid ground, I hastily unbound my turban from its foot and freed myself, and that not a moment too soon, for the bird, pouncing upon a huge snake, killed it with a few blows from its powerful beak, and seizing it up, rose into the air once more, and soon disappeared from my view. When I had looked about me, I began to doubt if I had gained anything by quitting the desolate island. The valley in which I found myself was deep and narrow, and surrounded by mountains which towered into the clouds, and were so steep and rocky that there was no way of climbing up their sides. As I wandered about, seeking anxiously for some means of escaping from this trap, I observed that the ground was strewn with diamonds some of them of an astonishing size. This sight gave me great pleasure, but my delight was speedily damped when I saw also numbers of horrible snakes, so long and so large that the smallest of them could have swallowed an elephant with ease. Fortunately for me, they seemed to hide in caverns of the rocks by day and only came out by night, probably because of their enemy, the rock. All day long I wandered up and down the valley, and when it grew dusk I crept into a little cave, and having blocked up the entrance to it with a stone, I ate part of my little store of food and lay down to sleep. But all through the night the serpents crawled to and fro, hissing horribly, so that I could scarcely close my eyes for terror. I was thankful when the morning light appeared, and when I judged by the silence that the serpents had retreated to their dens, I came tremblingly out of my cave and wandered up and down the valley once more, kicking the diamonds contemptuously out of my path, for I felt that they were indeed vain things to a man in my situation. At last, overcome with weariness, I sat down upon a rock, but I had hardly closed my eyes when I was startled by something which fell to the ground with a thud close beside me. It was a huge piece of fresh meat, and as I stared at it, several more pieces rolled over the cliffs in different places. I had always thought that the stories the sailors told of the famous Valley of Diamonds and of the cunning way which some merchants had devised for getting at the precious stones were mere traveller's tales invented to give pleasure to the hearers but now I perceived that they were surely true. These merchants came to the valley at the time when the eagles, which keep their eyries in the rocks, had hatched their young. The merchants then threw great lumps of meat into the valley. These, falling with so much force upon the diamonds, were sure to take up some of the precious stones with them, when the eagles pounced upon the meat and carried it off to their nests to feed their hungry broods. Then the merchants, scaring away the parent birds with shouts and outcries, would secure their treasures. Until this moment, 
I had looked upon the valley as my grave, for I had seen no possibility of getting out of it alive. But now I took courage and began to devise a means of escape. I began by picking up all the largest diamonds I could find and storing them carefully in the leathern wallet which had held my provisions. These I tied securely to my belt. I then chose the piece of meat which seemed most suited to my purpose, and with the aid of my turban bound it firmly to my back. This done, I laid down upon my face and awaited the coming of the eagles. I soon heard the flapping of their mighty wings above me, and had the satisfaction of feeling one of them seize upon my piece of meat, and me with it, and rise slowly towards his nest, into which he presently dropped me. Luckily for me, the merchants were on the watch, and setting up their usual outcries, they rushed to the nest, scaring away the eagle. Their amazement was great when they discovered me, and also their disappointment, and with one accord they fell to abusing me for having robbed them of their usual profit. Addressing myself to the one who seemed most aggrieved, I said, I am sure, if you knew all that I have suffered, you would show more kindness towards me, and as for diamonds, I have enough here of the very best for you and me and all your company. So saying, I showed them to him. The others all crowded round me, wondering at my adventures and admiring the device by which I had escaped from the valley, and when they had led me to their camp and examined my diamonds, they assured me that in all the years that they had carried on their trade, they had seen no stones to be compared with them for size and beauty. I found that each merchant chose a particular nest and took his chance of what he might find in it. So I begged the one who owned the nest to which I had been carried to take as much as he would of my treasure. But he contented himself with one stone, and that by no means the largest, assuring me that with such a gem his fortune was made, and he need toil no more. I stayed with the merchants several days, and then, as they were journeying homewards, I gladly accompanied them. Our way lay across high mountains infested with frightful serpents, but we had the good luck to escape them, and came at last to the seashore. Thence we sailed to the Isle of Rohat, where the camphor trees grow to such a size that a hundred men could shelter under one of them with ease. The sap flows from an incision made high up in the tree into a vessel hung there to receive it, and soon hardens into the substance called camphor, but the tree itself withers up and dies when it has been so treated. In this same island we saw the rhinoceros, an animal which is smaller than the elephant and larger than the buffalo. It has one horn about a cubit long which is solid, but has a furrow from the base to the tip. Upon it is traced in white lines the figure of a man. The rhinoceros fights with the elephant, and transfixing him with his horn, carries him off upon his head. But becoming blinded with the blood of his enemy, he falls helpless to the ground, and then comes the rock and clutches them both up in his talons and takes them to feed his young. This doubtless astonishes you, but if you do not believe my tale, go to Rohat and see for yourself. For fear of wearying you, I pass over in silence many other wonderful things which we saw in this island. Before we left, I exchanged one of my diamonds for much goodly merchandise, by which I profited greatly on our homeward way. At last we reached Balsora, whence I hastened to Baghdad, where my first action was to bestow large sums of money upon the poor, after which I settled down to enjoy tranquilly the riches I had gained with so much toil and pain. Having thus related the adventures of his second voyage, Sinbad again bestowed a hundred sequins upon Hindbad, inviting him to come again on the following day and hear how he fared upon his third voyage. The other guests also departed to their homes, but all returned at the same hour next day, including the porter, whose former life of hard work and poverty had already begun to seem to him like a bad dream. Again, after the feast was over, did Sinbad claim the attention of his guests and began the account of his third voyage.
Third Voyage After a very short time, the pleasant, easy life I led made me quite forget the perils of my two voyages. Moreover, as I was still in the prime of life, it pleased me better to be up and doing. So once more, providing myself with the rarest and choicest merchandise of Baghdad, I conveyed it to Balsora and set sail with other merchants of my acquaintance for distant lands. We had touched at many ports and made much profit, when one day, upon the open sea, we were caught by a terrible wind which blew us completely out of our reckoning, and lasting for several days, finally drove us into harbour on a strange island. "'I would rather have come to anchor anywhere than here,' quoth our captain. "'This island and all adjoining it are inhabited by hairy savages who are certain to attack us,' and whatever these dwarfs may do, we dare not resist, since they swarm like locusts, and if one of them is killed, the rest will fall upon us, and speedily make an end of us. These words caused great consternation among all the ship's company, and only too soon we were to find out that the captain spoke truly. There appeared a vast multitude of hideous savages, not more than two feet high, and covered with reddish fur. Throwing themselves into the waves, they surrounded our vessel, chattering meanwhile in a language we could not understand, and clutching at ropes and gangways, they swarmed up the ship's side with such speed and agility that they almost seemed to fly. You may imagine the rage and terror that seized us as we watched them, neither daring to hinder them nor able to speak a word to deter them from their purpose, whatever it might be. Of this we were not left long in doubt. Hoisting the sails and cutting the cable of the anchor, they sailed our vessel to an island which lay a little further off, where they drove us ashore. Then, taking possession of her, they made off to the place from which they had come, leaving us helpless upon a shore avoided with horror by all mariners, for a reason which you will soon learn. Turning away from the sea, we wandered miserably inland finding as we went various herbs and fruits which we ate, feeling that we might as well live as long as possible, though we had no hope of escape. Presently we saw in the far distance what seemed to us to be a splendid palace, towards which we turned our weary steps, but when we reached it we saw that it was a castle, lofty and strongly built. Pushing back the heavy ebony doors, we entered the courtyard, but upon the threshold of the great hall beyond it, we paused, frozen with horror at the sight which greeted us. On one side lay a huge pile of bones, human bones, and on the other numberless spits for roasting. Overcome with despair, we sank trembling to the ground and lay there without speech or motion. The sun was setting when a loud noise aroused us. The door of the hall was violently burst open, and a horrible giant entered. He was as tall as a palm tree, and had one eye which flamed like a burning coal in the middle of his forehead. His teeth were long and sharp, and grinned horribly, while his lower lip hung down upon his chest, and he had ears like elephant's ears, which covered his shoulders, and nails like the claws of some fierce bird. At this terrible sight, our senses left us, and we lay like dead men. When at last we came to ourselves, the giant sat examining us attentively with his fearful eye. Presently, when he had looked at us enough, he came towards us, and stretching out his hand, took me by the back of the neck, turning me this way and that. But feeling that I was mere skin and bone, he set me down again and went on to the next, whom he treated in the same fashion. At last, he came to the captain, and finding him the fattest of us all, he took him up in one hand and stuck him upon a spit, and proceeded to kindle a huge fire, at which he presently roasted him. After the giant had supped, he lay down to sleep, snoring like the loudest thunder, while we lay shivering with horror the whole night through, and when day broke, he awoke and went out, leaving us in the castle. When we believed him to be really gone, we started up bemoaning our horrible fate, until the hall echoed with our despairing cries. 
Though we were many and our enemy was alone, it did not occur to us to kill him, and indeed we should have found that a hard task, even if we had thought of it, and no plan could we devise to deliver ourselves. So at last, submitting to our sad fate, we spent the day in wandering up and down the island, eating such fruits as we could find, and when night came, we returned to the castle, having sought in vain for any other place of shelter. At sunset, the giant returned, supped upon one of our unhappy comrades, slept and snored till dawn, and then left us as before. Our condition seemed to us so frightful that several of my companions thought it would be better to leap from the cliffs and perish in the waves at once, rather than await so miserable an end. But I had a plan of escape which I now unfolded to them, and which they at once agreed to attempt. Listen, my brothers, I added, you know that plenty of driftwood lies along the shore. Let us make several rafts and carry them to a suitable place. If our plot succeeds, we can wait patiently for the chance of some passing ship which would rescue us from this fatal island. If it fails, we must quickly take to our rafts. Frail as they are, we have more chance of saving our lives with them than we have if we remain here. All agreed with me, and we spent the day in building rafts, each capable of carrying three persons. At nightfall we returned to the castle, and very soon in came the giant, and one more of our number was sacrificed. But the time of our vengeance was at hand. As soon as he had finished his horrible repast, he lay down to sleep as before, and when we heard him begin to snore, I and nine of the boldest of my comrades rose softly and took each a spit, which we made red hot in the fire, and then, at a given signal, we plunged it with one accord into the giant's eye, completely blinding him. Uttering a terrible cry, he sprang to his feet, clutching in all directions to try to seize one of us. But we had all fled different ways as soon as the deed was done and thrown ourselves flat upon the ground in corners where he was not likely to touch us with his feet. After a vain search, he fumbled about till he found the door and fled out of it howling frightfully. As for us, when he was gone, we made haste to leave the fatal castle, and, stationing ourselves beside our rafts, we waited to see what would happen. Our idea was that if, when the sun rose, we saw nothing of the giant, and no longer heard his howls, which still came faintly through the darkness, growing more and more distant, we should conclude that he was dead, and that we might safely stay upon the island and need not risk our lives upon the frail rafts. But alas, morning light showed us our enemy approaching us, supported on either hand by two giants nearly as large and fearful as himself, while a crowd of others followed close upon their heels. Hesitating no longer, we clambered upon our raft and rowed with all our might out to sea. The giants, seeing their prey escaping them, seized up huge pieces of rock, and wading into the water, hurled them after us with such good aim that all the rafts except the one I was upon were swamped, and their luckless crews drowned without our being able to do anything to help them. Indeed, I and my two companions had all we could do to keep our own raft beyond the reach of the giants. But by dint of hard rowing, we at last gained the open sea. Here we were at the mercy of the winds and waves, which tossed us to and fro all that day and night. But the next morning we found ourselves near an island, upon which we gladly landed. There we found delicious fruits, and having satisfied our hunger, we presently lay down to rest upon the shore. Suddenly we were aroused by a loud rustling noise, and starting up, saw that it was caused by an immense snake which was gliding towards us over the sand. So swiftly it came that it had seized one of my comrades before he had time to fly, and in spite of his cries and struggles, speedily crushed the life out of him in his mighty coils, and proceeded to swallow him. 
By this time, my other companion and I were running for our lives to some place where we might hope to be safe from this new horror, and seeing a tall tree, we climbed up into it, having first provided ourselves with a store of fruit off the surrounding bushes. When night came, I fell asleep, but only to be awakened once more by the terrible snake, which, after hissing horribly round the tree, at last reared itself up against it, and finding my sleeping comrade who was perched just below me, it swallowed him also, and crawled away, leaving me half dead with terror. When the sun rose, I crept down from the tree, with hardly a hope of escaping the dreadful fate which had overtaken my comrades. But life is sweet, and I determined to do all I could to save myself. All day long I toiled with frantic haste and collected quantities of dry brushwood, reeds and thorns, which I bound with logs, and making a circle of them under my tree, I piled them firmly one upon another until I had a kind of tent in which I crouched like a mouse in a hole when she sees the cat coming. You may imagine what a fearful night I passed, for the snake returned, eager to devour me, and glided round and round my frail shelter, seeking an entrance. Every moment I feared that it would succeed in pushing aside some of the logs. But happily for me, they held together, and when it grew light, my enemy retired, baffled and hungry, to his den. As for me, I was more dead than alive. Shaking with fright and half suffocated by the poisonous breath of the monster, I came out of my tent and crawled down to the sea, feeling that it would be better to plunge from the cliffs and end my life at once than pass such another night of horror. But to my joy and relief, I saw a ship sailing by, and by shouting wildly and waving my turban, I managed to attract the attention of her crew. A boat was sent to rescue me, and very soon I found myself on board, surrounded by a wandering crowd of sailors and merchants, eager to know by what chance I found myself in that desolate island. After I had told my story, they regaled me with the choicest food the ship afforded, and the captain, seeing that I was in rags, generously bestowed upon me one of his own coats. After sailing about for some time, and touching at many ports, we came at last to the island of Salahat, where sandalwood grows in great abundance. Here we anchored, and as I stood watching the merchants disembarking their goods and preparing to sell or exchange them, the captain came up to me and said, I have here, brother, some merchandise belonging to a passenger of mine who is dead. Will you do me the favour to trade with it, and when I meet with his heirs I shall be able to give them the money, though it will be only just that you shall have a portion for your trouble. I consented gladly, for I did not like standing by idle. Whereupon he pointed the bales out to me, and sent for the person whose duty it was to keep a list of the goods that were upon the ship. When this man came, he asked in what name the merchandise was to be registered. In the name of Sinbad the Sailor, replied the captain. At this, I was greatly surprised, but looking carefully at him, I recognized him to be the captain of the ship upon which I had made my second voyage, though he had altered much since that time. As for him, believing me to be dead, it was no wonder that he had not recognized me. So, captain, said I, the merchant who owned those bales was called Sinbad. Yes, he replied, he was so named... He belonged to Baghdad and joined my ship at Bolsora. But by mischance he was left behind upon a desert island where we had landed to fill up our water casks, and it was not until four hours later that he was missed. By that time the wind had freshened and it was impossible to put back for him. You suppose him to have perished then? said I. Alas, yes, he answered. Why, Captain, I cried. Look well at me. I am that Sinbad who fell asleep upon the island and awoke to find himself abandoned. The captain stared at me in amazement, but was presently convinced that I was indeed speaking the truth and rejoiced greatly at my escape. 
I am glad to have that piece of carelessness off my conscience at any rate, said he. Now take your goods, and the profit I have made for you upon them, and may you prosper in future. I took them gratefully, and as we went from one island to another, I laid in stores of cloves, cinnamon, and other spices. In one place I saw a tortoise which was twenty cubits long, and as many broad, also a fish that was like a cow, and had skin so thick that it was used to make shields. Another I saw that was like a camel in shape and colour. So by degrees we came back to Balsora, and I returned to Baghdad with so much money that I could not myself count it, besides treasures without end. I gave largely to the poor, and bought much land to add to what I already possessed, and thus ended my third voyage. When Sinbad had finished his story, he gave another hundred sequins to Hinbad, who then departed with the other guests. But next day, when they had all reassembled and the banquet was ended, their host continued his adventures. Fourth Voyage Rich and happy as I was after my third voyage, I could not make up my mind to stay at home altogether. My love of trading and the pleasure I took in anything that was new and strange made me set my affairs in order and begin my journey through some of the Persian provinces, having first sent off stores of goods to await my coming in the different places I intended to visit. I took ship at a distant seaport, and for some time all went well, but at last being caught in a violent hurricane, our vessel became a total wreck in spite of all our worthy captain could do to save her, and many of our company perished in the waves. I, with a few others, had the good fortune to be washed ashore, clinging to pieces of the wreck, for the storm had driven us near an island, and scrambling up beyond the reach of the waves, we threw ourselves down, quite exhausted, to wait for morning, at daylight we wandered inland, and soon saw some huts, to which we directed our steps. As we drew near, their inhabitants swarmed out in great numbers and surrounded us, and we were led to their houses, and, as it were, divided among our captors. I, with five others, was taken into a hut, where we were made to sit on the ground, and certain herbs were given to us, which the natives made signs to us to eat. Observing that they themselves did not touch them, I was careful only to pretend to taste my portion. But my companions, being very hungry, rashly ate up all that was set before them, and very soon I had the horror of seeing them become perfectly mad. Though they chattered incessantly, I could not understand a word they said, nor did they heed when I spoke to them. The savages now produced large bowls full of rice prepared with coconut oil, of which my crazy comrades ate eagerly, but I only tasted a few grains, understanding clearly that the object of our captors was to fatten us speedily for their own eating. And this was exactly what happened. My unlucky companions, having lost their reason, felt neither anxiety nor fear, and ate greedily all that was offered them. So they were soon fat, and there was an end of them. But I grew leaner day by day, for I ate but little, and even that little did me no good by reason of my fear of what lay before me. However, as I was so far from being a tempting morsel, I was allowed to wander about freely, and one day, when all the natives had gone off upon some expedition, leaving only an old man to guard me, I managed to escape from him and plunged into the forest, running faster the more he cried to me to come back, until I had completely distanced him. For seven days I hurried on, resting only when the darkness stopped me, and living chiefly upon coconuts, which afforded me both meat and drink, and on the eighth day I reached the seashore, and saw a party of men gathering pepper, which grew abundantly all about. Reassured by the nature of their occupation, I advanced towards them, and they greeted me in Arabic, asking who I was and whence I came. My delight was great on hearing this familiar speech, 
and I willingly satisfied their curiosity, telling them how I had been shipwrecked and captured by the natives. But these savages devour men, said they. How did you escape? I repeated to them what I have just told you, at which they were mightily astonished. I stayed with them until they had collected as much pepper as they wished, and then they took me back to their own country and presented me to their king, by whom I was hospitably received. To him also I had to relate my adventures, which surprised him much, and when I had finished, he ordered that I should be supplied with food and raiment and treated with consideration. The island on which I found myself was full of people, and abounded in all sorts of desirable things, and a great deal of traffic went on in the capital, where I soon began to feel at home and contented. Moreover, the king treated me with special favour, and in consequence of this, everyone, whether at the court or in the town, sought to make life pleasant to me. One thing I remarked which I thought very strange. This was that, from the greatest to the least, all men rode their horses without bridle or stirrups. I one day presumed to ask his majesty why he did not use them, to which he replied, You speak to me of things of which I have never before heard. This gave me an idea. I found a clever workman and made him cut out under my direction the foundation of a saddle, which I wadded and covered with choice leather adorning it with rich gold embroidery. I then got a locksmith to make me a bit and a pair of spurs after a pattern that I drew for him, and when all these things were completed, I presented them to the king and showed him how to use them. When I had saddled one of the horses, he mounted it and rode about quite delighted with the novelty, and to show his gratitude, he rewarded me with large gifts. After this, I had to make saddles for all the principal officers of the king's household, and as they all gave me rich presents, I soon became very wealthy and quite an important person in the city. One day the king sent for me and said, Sinbad, I am going to ask a favour of you. Both I and my subjects esteem you and wish you to end your days amongst us. Therefore I desire that you will marry a rich and beautiful lady whom I will find for you and think no more of your own country. As the king's will was law, I accepted the charming bride he presented to me and lived happily with her. Nevertheless, I had every intention of escaping at the first opportunity and going back to Baghdad. Things were thus going prosperously with me, when it happened that the wife of one of my neighbours, with whom I had struck up quite a friendship, fell ill and presently died. I went to his house to offer my consolations, and found him in the depths of woe. Heaven preserve you, said I, and send you a long life. Alas, he replied, what is the good of saying that, when I have but an hour left to live? Come, come, said I. Surely it is not so bad as all that. I trust that you may be spared to me for many years. I hope, answered he, that your life may be long, but as for me, all is finished. I have set my house in order, and today I shall be buried with my wife. This has been the law upon our island from the earliest ages. The living husband goes to the grave with his dead wife, the living wife with her dead husband. So did our fathers, and so must we do. The law changes not, and all must submit to it. As he spoke, the friends and relations of the unhappy pair began to assemble. The body, decked in rich robes and sparkling with jewels, was laid upon an open bier, and the procession started, taking its way to a high mountain at some distance from the city, the wretched husband, clothed from head to foot in a black mantle, following mournfully. When the place of interment was reached, the corpse was lowered, just as it was, into a deep pit. Then the husband, bidding farewell to all his friends, stretched himself upon another bier, upon which were laid seven little loaves of bread and a pitcher of water, and he also was let down, down, down to the depths of the horrible cavern, 
and then a stone was laid over the opening, and the melancholy company wended its way back to the city. You may imagine that I was no unmoved spectator of these proceedings. To all the others, it was a thing to which they had been accustomed from their youth up. But I was so horrified that I could not help telling the king how it struck me. Sire, I said, I am more astonished than I can express to you at the strange custom which exists in your dominions of burying the living with the dead. In all my travels I have never before met with so cruel and horrible a law. What would you have, Sinbad? he replied. It is the law for everybody. I myself should be buried with the queen if she were the first to die. But your majesty, said I, dare I ask if this law applies to foreigners also? Why, yes, replied the king, smiling, in what I could but consider a very heartless manner. They are no exception to the rule if they have married in the country. When I heard this, I went home much cast down, and from that time forward my mind was never easy. If only my wife's little finger ached, I fancied she was going to die, and sure enough, before very long she fell really ill, and in a few days breathed her last. My dismay was great, for it seemed to me that to be buried alive was even a worse fate than to be devoured by cannibals. Nevertheless, there was no escape. The body of my wife, arrayed in her richest robes and decked with all her jewels, was laid upon the bier. I followed it, and after me came a great procession, headed by the king and all his nobles, and in this order we reached the fatal mountain, which was one of a lofty chain bordering the sea. Here I made one more frantic effort to excite the pity of the king and those who stood by, hoping to save myself even at this last moment, but it was of no avail. No one spoke to me. They even appeared to hasten over their dreadful task, and I speedily found myself descending into the gloomy pit with my seven loaves and a pitcher of water beside me. Almost before I reached the bottom, the stone was rolled onto its place above my head, and I was left to my fate. A feeble ray of light shone into the cavern through some chink, and when I had the courage to look about me, I could see that I was in a vast vault bestrewn with bones and bodies of the dead. I even fancied that I heard the expiring sighs of those who, like myself, had come into this dismal place alive. All in vain did I shriek aloud with rage and despair, reproaching myself for the love of gain and adventure which had brought me to such a pass. But at length, growing calmer, I took up my bread and water, and wrapping my face in my mantle, I groped my way towards the end of the cavern where the air was fresher. Here I lived in darkness and misery until my provisions were exhausted. But just as I was nearly dead from starvation, the rock was rolled away overhead, and I saw that a beer was being lowered into the cavern, and that the corpse upon it was a man. In a moment my mind was made up. The woman who followed had nothing to expect but a lingering death. I should be doing her a service if I shortened her misery. Therefore, when she descended, already insensible from terror, I was ready armed with a huge bone, one blow from which left her dead, and I secured the bread and water which gave me a hope of life. Several times did I have recourse to this desperate expedient, and I know not how long I had been a prisoner, when one day I fancied that I heard something near me, which breathed loudly. Turning to the place from which the sound came, I dimly saw a shadowy form which fled at my movement, squeezing itself through a cranny in the wall. I pursued it as fast as I could, and found myself in a narrow crack among the rocks, along which I was just able to force my way. I followed it for what seemed to me many miles, and at last saw before me a glimmer of light which grew clearer every moment, until I emerged upon the seashore with a joy which I cannot describe. When I was sure that I was not dreaming, 
I realized that it was doubtless some little animal which had found its way into the cavern from the sea, and when disturbed had fled, showing me a means of escape which I could never have discovered for myself. I hastily surveyed my surroundings and saw that I was safe from all pursuit from the town. The mountains sloped sheer down to the sea, and there was no road across them. Being assured of this, I returned to the cavern and amassed a rich treasure of diamonds, rubies, emeralds, and jewels of all kinds which strewed the ground. These I made up into bales and stored them into a safe place upon the beach, and then waited hopefully for the passing of a ship. I had looked out for two days, however, before a single sail appeared, so it was with much delight that I at last saw a vessel not very far from the shore, and by waving my arms and uttering loud cries, succeeded in attracting the attention of her crew. A boat was sent off to me, and in answer to the questions of the sailors as to how I came to be in such a plight, I replied that I had been shipwrecked two days before, but had managed to scramble ashore with the bales which I pointed out to them. Luckily for me, they believed my story, and without even looking at the place where they found me, took up my bundles and rowed me back to the ship. Once on board, I soon saw that the captain was too much occupied with the difficulties of navigation to pay much heed to me, though he generously made me welcome, and would not even accept the jewels with which I offered to pay my passage. Our voyage was prosperous, and after visiting many lands and collecting in each place great store of goodly merchandise, I found myself at last in Baghdad once more, with unheard of riches of every description. Again I gave large sums of money to the poor and enriched all the mosques in the city, after which I gave myself up to my friends and relations, with whom I passed my time in feasting and merriment. Here Sinbad paused, and all his hearers declared that the adventures of his fourth voyage had pleased them better than anything they had heard before. They then took their leave, followed by Hinbad, who had once more received a hundred sequins, and with the rest had been bidden to return next day for the story of the fifth voyage. When the time came, all were in their places, and when they had eaten and drunk of all that was set before them, Sinbad began his tale. Fifth Voyage Not even all that I had gone through could make me contented with a quiet life. I soon wearied of its pleasures and longed for change and adventure. Therefore I set out once more, but this time in a ship of my own, which I built and fitted out at the nearest seaport. I wished to be able to call at whatever port I chose, taking my own time, but as I did not intend carrying enough goods for a full cargo, I invited several merchants of different nations to join me. We set sail with the first favourable wind, and after a long voyage upon the open seas, we landed upon an unknown island which proved to be uninhabited. We determined, however, to explore it, but had not gone far when we found a rock's egg, as large as the one I had seen before, and evidently very nearly hatched, for the beak of the young bird had already pierced the shell. In spite of all I could say to deter them, the merchants who were with me fell upon it with their hatchets, breaking the shell and killing the young rock. Then, lighting a fire upon the ground, they hacked morsels from the bird and proceeded to roast them while I stood by, aghast. Scarcely had they finished their ill-omened repast when the air above us was darkened by two mighty shadows. The captain of my ship, knowing by experience what this meant, cried out to us that the parent birds were coming and urged us to get on board with all speed. This we did, and the sails were hoisted. But before we had made any way, the rocks reached their despoiled nest and hovered about it, uttering frightful cries when they discovered the mangled remains of their young one. For a moment we lost sight of them and were flattering ourselves that we had escaped when they reappeared and soared into the air directly over our vessel, 
and we saw that each held in its claws an immense rock ready to crush us. There was a moment of breathless suspense, then one bird loosed its hold and the huge block of stone hurtled through the air. But thanks to the presence of mind of the helmsman, who turned our ship violently in another direction, it fell into the sea, close beside us, cleaving it asunder till we could nearly see the bottom. We had hardly time to draw a breath of relief before the other rock fell with a mighty crash right in the midst of our luckless vessel, smashing it into a thousand fragments and crushing or hurling into the sea passengers and crew. I myself went down with the rest, but had the good fortune to rise unhurt, and by holding on to a piece of driftwood with one hand and swimming with the other, I kept myself afloat and was presently washed up by the tide onto an island. Its shores were steep and rocky, but I scrambled up safely and threw myself down to rest upon the green turf. When I had somewhat recovered, I began to examine the spot in which I found myself, and truly it seemed to me that I had reached a garden of delight. There were trees everywhere, and they were laden with flowers and fruit, while a crystal stream wandered in and out under their shadow. When night came, I slept sweetly in a cosy nook, though the remembrance that I was alone in a strange land made me sometimes start up and look around me in alarm, and then I wished heartily that I had stayed at home at ease. However, the morning sunlight restored my courage, and I once more wandered among the trees, but always with some anxiety as to what I might see next. I had penetrated some distance into the island, when I saw an old man, bent and feeble, sitting upon the river bank, and at first I took him to be some shipwrecked mariner like myself. Going up to him, I greeted him in a friendly way, but he only nodded his head at me in reply. I then asked what he did there, and he made signs to me that he wished to get across the river to gather some fruit, and seemed to beg me to carry him on my back. Pitying his age and feebleness, I took him up, and wading across the stream, I bent down, that he might more easily reach the bank, and bade him get down. But instead of allowing himself to be set upon his feet, even now it makes me laugh to think of it, this creature, who had seemed to me so decrepit, leapt nimbly upon my shoulders, and hooking his legs round my neck, gripped me so tightly that I was well nigh choked, and so overcome with terror that I fell insensible to the ground. When I recovered, my enemy was still in his place, though he had released his hold enough to allow me breathing space, and seeing me revive, he prodded me adroitly, first with one foot and then with the other, until I was forced to get up and stagger about with him under the trees, while he gathered and ate the choicest fruits. This went on all day, and even at night, when I threw myself down half dead with weariness, the terrible old man held on tight to my neck. Nor did he fail to greet the first glimmer of morning light by drumming upon me with his heels until I perforce awoke and resumed my dreary march with rage and bitterness in my heart. It happened one day that I passed a tree under which lay several dry gourds, and catching one up, I amused myself with scooping out its contents and pressing into it the juice of several bunches of grapes which hung from every bush. When it was full, I left it propped in the fork of a tree, and a few days later, carrying the hateful old man that way, I snatched at my gourd as I passed it, and had the satisfaction of a draught of excellent wine, so good and refreshing, that I even forgot my detestable burden, and began to sing and caper. The old monster was not slow to perceive the effect which my draught had produced, and that I carried him more lightly than usual, so he stretched out his skinny hand, and seizing the gourd, first tasted its contents cautiously, then drained them to the very last drop. The wine was strong, and the gourd capacious, so he also began to sing after a fashion and soon I had the delight of feeling the iron grip of his goblin legs unclasp, and with one vigorous effort I threw him to the ground, from which he never moved again. 
I was so rejoiced to have at last got rid of this uncanny old man that I ran leaping and bounding down to the seashore, where, by the greatest good luck, I met with some mariners who had anchored off the island to enjoy the delicious fruits and to renew their supply of water. They heard the story of my escape with amazement, saying, You fell into the hands of the old man of the sea, and it is a mercy that he did not strangle you, as he has everyone else upon whose shoulders he has managed to perch himself. This island is well known as the scene of his evil deeds, and no merchant or sailor who lands upon it cares to stray far away from his comrades. After we had talked for a while, they took me back with them on board their ship, where the captain received me kindly, and we soon set sail, and after several days reached a large and prosperous-looking town, where all the houses were built of stone. Here we anchored, and one of the merchants, who had been very friendly to me on the way, took me ashore with him and showed me a lodging set apart for strange merchants. He then provided me with a large sack and pointed out to me a party of others equipped in like manner. Go with them, said he, and do as they do, but beware of losing sight of them, for if you strayed, your life would be in danger. With that, he supplied me with provisions and bade me farewell, and I set out with my new companions. I soon learnt that the object of our expedition was to fill our sacks with coconuts, but when at length I saw the trees and noted their immense height and the slippery smoothness of their slender trunks, I did not at all understand how we were to do it. The crowns of the cocoa palms were all alive with monkeys, big and little, which skipped from one to the other with surprising agility, seeming to be curious about us and disturbed at our appearance, and I was at first surprised when my companions, after collecting stones, began to throw them at the lively creatures, which seemed to me quite harmless. But very soon I saw the reason of it and joined them heartily, for the monkeys, annoyed and wishing to pay us back in our own coin, began to tear the nuts from the trees and cast them at us with angry and spiteful gestures, so that after very little labour our sacks were filled with the fruit which we could not otherwise have obtained. As soon as we had as many as we could carry, we went back to the town where my friend bought my share and advised me to continue the same occupation until I had earned money enough to carry me to my own country. This I did, and before long had amassed a considerable sum. Just then I heard that there was a trading ship ready to sail, and taking leave of my friend, I went on board, carrying with me a goodly store of coconuts, and we sailed first to the islands where pepper grows, then to Kamari, where the best aloes wood is found, and where men drink no wine but by an unalterable law. Here I exchanged my nuts for pepper and good aloes wood, and went a fishing for pearls with some of the other merchants, and my dives were so lucky that very soon I had an immense number, and those very large and perfect. With all these treasures I came joyfully back to Baghdad, where I disposed of them for large sums of money, of which I did not fail, as before, to give the tenth part to the poor. And after that I rested from my labours and comforted myself with all the pleasures that my riches could give me. Having thus ended his story, Sinbad ordered that one hundred sequins should be given to Hinbad, and the guests then withdrew. But after the next day's feast, he began the account of his sixth voyage, as follows. Sixth Voyage It must be a marvel to you how, after having five times met with shipwreck and unheard of perils, I could again tempt fortune and risk fresh trouble. I am even surprised myself when I look back. But evidently it was my fate to rove, and after a year of repose I prepared to make a sixth voyage, regardless of the entreaties of my friends and relations, who did all they could to keep me at home. Instead of going by the Persian Gulf, I travelled a considerable way overland, and finally embarked from a distant Indian port, 
with a captain who meant to make a long voyage. And truly, he did so, for we fell in with stormy weather, which drove us completely out of our course, so that for many days neither captain nor pilot knew where we were, nor where we were going. When they did at last discover our position, we had small ground for rejoicing, for the captain, casting his turban upon the deck and tearing his beard, declared that we were in the most dangerous spot upon the whole wide sea, and had been caught by a current which was at that minute sweeping us to destruction. It was too true. In spite of all the sailors could do, we were driven with frightful rapidity towards the foot of a mountain which rose sheer out of the sea, and our vessel was dashed to pieces upon the rocks at its base. Not, however, until we had managed to scramble on shore, carrying with us the most precious of our possessions. When we had done this, the captain said to us, Now we are here, we may as well begin to dig our graves at once, since from this fatal spot no shipwrecked mariner has ever returned. This speech discouraged us much, and we began to lament over our sad fate. The mountain formed the seaward boundary of a large island, and the narrow strip of rocky shore upon which we stood was strewn with the wreckage of a thousand gallant ships, while the bones of the luckless mariners shone white in the sunshine, and we shuddered to think how soon our own would be added to the heap. All around, too, lay vast quantities of the costliest merchandise, and treasures were heaped in every cranny of the rocks. But all these things only added to the desolation of the scene. It struck me as a very strange thing that a river of clear, fresh water, which gushed out from the mountain not far from where we were stood, instead of flowing into the sea, as rivers generally do, turned off sharply and flowed out of sight, under a natural archway of rock. And when I went to examine it more closely, I found that inside the cave, the walls were thick with diamonds and rubies and masses of crystal, and the floor was strewn with ambergris. Here then, upon this desolate shore, we abandoned ourselves to our fate, for there was no possibility of scaling the mountain, and if a ship had appeared, it could only have shared our doom." The first thing our captain did was to divide equally amongst us all the food we possessed, and then the length of each man's life depended on the time he could make his portion last. I myself could live upon very little. Nevertheless, by the time I had buried the last of my companions, my stock of provisions was so small that I hardly thought I should live long enough to dig my own grave, which I set about doing while I regretted bitterly the roving disposition which was always bringing me into such straits, and thought longingly of all the comfort and luxury that I had left. But luckily for me, the fancy took me to stand once more beside the river, where it plunged out of sight in the depths of the cavern. And as I did so, an idea struck me. This river, which hid itself underground, doubtless emerged again at some distant spot, why should I not build a raft and trust myself to its swiftly flowing waters? If I perished before I could reach the light of day once more, I should be no worse off than I was now, for death stared me in the face, while there was always the possibility that, as I was born under a lucky star, I might find myself safe and sound in some desirable land. I decided at any rate to risk it, and speedily built myself a stout raft of driftwood with strong cords, of which enough and to spare lay strewn upon the beach. I then made up many packages of rubies, emeralds, rock crystal, ambergris, and precious stuffs, and bound them upon my raft, being careful to preserve the balance, and then I seated myself upon it, having two small oars that I had fashioned laid ready to my hand and loosed the cord which held it to the bank. Once out in the current, my raft flew swiftly under the gloomy archway, and I found myself in total darkness, carried smoothly forward by the rapid river. On I went, as it seemed to me, for many nights and days. Once the channel became so small that I had a narrow escape of being crushed against the rocky roof, 
and after that I took the precaution of lying flat upon my precious bales. Though I only ate what was absolutely necessary to keep myself alive, the inevitable moment came when, after swallowing my last morsel of food, I began to wonder if I must, after all, die of hunger. Then, worn out with anxiety and fatigue, I fell into a deep sleep, and when I again opened my eyes, I was once more in the light of day. A beautiful country lay before me, and my raft, which was tied to the river bank, was surrounded by friendly-looking men. I rose and saluted them, and they spoke to me in return, but I could not understand a word of their language. Feeling perfectly bewildered by my sudden return to life and light, I murmured to myself in Arabic, Close thine eyes, and while thou sleepest, heaven will change thy fortune from evil to good. One of the natives who understood this tongue then came forward, saying, My brother, be not surprised to see us. This is our land, and as we came to get water from the river, we noticed your raft floating down it, and one of us swam out and brought you to the shore. We have waited for your awakening. Tell us now whence you come, and where you were going by that dangerous way. I replied that nothing would please me better than to tell them, but that I was starving and would fain eat something first. I was soon supplied with all I needed, and having satisfied my hunger, I told them faithfully all that had befallen me. They were lost in wonder at my tale when it was interpreted to them, and said that adventures so surprising must be related to their king only by the man to whom they had happened. So, procuring a horse, they mounted me upon it, and we set out, followed by several strong men carrying my raft just as it was, upon their shoulders. In this order we marched into the city of Serendib, where the natives presented me to their king, whom I saluted in the Indian fashion, prostrating myself at his feet and kissing the ground. But the monarch bade me rise and sit beside him, asking first what was my name. I am Sinbad, I replied, whom men call the sailor, for I have voyaged much upon many seas. And how come you here? asked the king. I told my story, concealing nothing, and his surprise and delight were so great that he ordered my adventures to be written in letters of gold and laid up in the archives of his kingdom. Presently my raft was brought in, and the bales opened in his presence, and the king declared that in all his treasury there were no such rubies and emeralds as those which lay in great heaps before him. Seeing that he looked at them with interest, I ventured to say that I myself and all that I had were at his disposal. But he answered me, smiling, Nay, Sinbad, heaven forbid that I should covet your riches, I will rather add to them, for I desire that you shall not leave my kingdom without some tokens of my good will. He then commanded his officers to provide me with suitable lodging at his expense, and sent slaves to wait upon me and carry my raft and my bales to my new dwelling place. You may imagine that I praised his generosity and gave him grateful thanks, nor did I fail to present myself daily in his audience chamber and for the rest of my time I amused myself in seeing all that was most worthy of attention in the city. The island of Serendib being situated on the equinoctial line, the days and nights there are of equal length. The chief city is placed at the end of a beautiful valley formed by the highest mountain in the world, which is in the middle of the island. I had the curiosity to ascend to its very summit, for this was the place to which Adam was banished out of paradise. Here are found rubies and many precious things, and rare plants grow abundantly with cedar trees and cocoa palms. On the seashore and at the mouths of the rivers, the divers seek for pearls, and in some valleys diamonds are plentiful. After many days I petitioned the king that I might return to my own country, to which he graciously consented. Moreover, he loaded me with rich gifts, and when I went to take leave of him, he entrusted me with a royal present and letter 
to the commander of the faithful, our sovereign lord, saying, I pray you give these to the caliph Harun al-Rashid and assure him of my friendship. I accepted the charge respectfully and soon embarked upon the vessel which the king himself had chosen for me. The king's letter was written in blue characters upon a rare and precious skin of yellowish color, and these were the words of it. The king of the Indies, before whom walk a thousand elephants, who lives in a palace of which the roof blazes with a hundred thousand rubies, and whose treasure house contains twenty thousand diamond crowns, to the caliph Harun al-Rashid, sends greeting. Though the offering we present to you is unworthy of your notice, we pray you to accept it as a mark of the esteem and friendship which we cherish for you, and of which we gladly send you this token, and we ask of you a like regard if you deem us worthy of it. Adieu, brother. The present consisted of a vase carved from a single ruby, six inches high and as thick as my finger. This was filled with the choicest pearls, large and of perfect shape and luster. Secondly, a huge snakeskin with scales as large as a sequin, which would preserve from sickness those who slept upon it. Then quantities of aloes wood, camphor and pistachio nuts, and lastly, a beautiful slave girl whose robes glittered with precious stones. After a long and prosperous voyage, we landed at Bolsora, and I made haste to reach Baghdad, and taking the king's letter, I presented myself at the palace gate, followed by the beautiful girl and various members of my own family bearing the treasure. As soon as I had declared my errand, I was conducted into the presence of the caliph, to whom, after I had made my obeisance, I gave the letter and the king's gift, and when he had examined them, he demanded of me whether the prince of Serendib was really as rich and powerful as he claimed to be. Commander of the faithful, I replied, again bowing humbly before him. I can assure your majesty that he has in no way exaggerated his wealth and grandeur. Nothing can equal the magnificence of his palace. When he goes abroad, his throne is prepared upon the back of an elephant, and on either side of him ride his ministers, his favourites, and courtiers. On his elephant's neck sits an officer, his golden lance in his hand, and behind him stands another bearing a pillar of gold, at the top of which is an emerald as long as my hand. A thousand men in cloth of gold, mounted upon richly caparisoned elephants, go before him, and as the procession moves onward, the officer who guides his elephant cries aloud, Behold the mighty monarch, the powerful and valiant Sultan of the Indies, whose palace is covered with a hundred thousand rubies, who possesses twenty thousand diamond crowns. Behold, a monarch greater than Solomon and Mirage in all their glory. Then the one who stands behind the throne answers, This king, so great and powerful, must die, must die, must die. And the first takes up the chant again. All praise to him who lives forevermore. Further, my lord, in Serendib, no judge is needed, for to the king himself his people come for justice. The caliph was well satisfied with my report. From the king's letter, said he, I judged that he was a wise man. It seems that he is worthy of his people and his people of him. So saying, he dismissed me with rich presents, and I returned in peace to my own house. When Sinbad had done speaking, his guests withdrew, Hinbad having first received a hundred sequins, but all returned next day to hear the story of the seventh voyage. Sinbad thus began. Seventh and Last Voyage After my sixth voyage, I was quite determined that I would go to sea no more. I was now of an age to appreciate a quiet life, and I had run risks enough. I only wished to end my days in peace. One day, however, when I was entertaining a number of my friends, 
I was told that an officer of the Caliph wished to speak to me, and when he was admitted, he bade me follow him into the presence of Harun al-Rashid, which I accordingly did. After I had saluted him, the Caliph said, I have sent for you, Sinbad, because I need your services. I have chosen you to bear a letter and a gift to the king of Serendib in return for his message of friendship. The Caliph's commandment fell upon me like a thunderbolt. Commander of the faithful, I answered, I am ready to do all that your majesty commands, but I humbly pray you to remember that I am utterly disheartened by the unheard-of sufferings I have undergone. Indeed, I have made a vow never again to leave Baghdad. With this, I gave him a long account of some of my strangest adventures, to which he listened patiently. I admit, said he, that you have indeed had some extraordinary experiences, but I do not see why they should hinder you from doing as I wish. You have only to go straight to Serendib and give my message, then you are free to come back and do as you will. But go, you must. My honour and dignity demand it. Seeing that there was no help for it, I declared myself willing to obey, and the caliph, delighted at having got his own way, gave me a thousand sequins for the expenses of the voyage. I was soon ready to start, and taking the letter and the present, I embarked at Bolsora and sailed quickly and safely to Serendib. Here, when I had disclosed my errand, I was well received and brought into the presence of the king, who greeted me with joy. "'Welcome, Sinbad,' he cried. "'I have thought of you often and rejoiced to see you once more.' After thanking him for the honour that he did me, I displayed the caliph's gifts. First, a bed, with complete hangings all cloth of gold, which cost a thousand sequins, and another like to it of crimson stuff. Fifty robes of rich embroidery, a hundred of the finest white linen from Cairo, Suez, Kufa, and Alexandria. Then more beds of different fashion, and an agate vase carved with the figure of a man aiming an arrow at a lion, and finally a costly table which had once belonged to King Solomon, the king of Serendib received with satisfaction the assurance of the caliph's friendliness toward him, and now my task being accomplished, I was anxious to depart, but it was some time before the king would think of letting me go. At last, however, he dismissed me with many presents, and I lost no time in going on board a ship, which sailed at once, and for four days all went well. On the fifth day, we had the misfortune to fall in with pirates who seized our vessel, killing all who resisted and making prisoners of those who were prudent enough to submit at once, of whom I was one. When they had despoiled us of all we possessed, they forced us to put on vile raiment and, sailing to a distant island, there sold us for slaves. I fell into the hands of a rich merchant, who took me home with him, and clothed and fed me well, and after some days sent for me and questioned me as to what I could do. I answered that I was a rich merchant who had been captured by pirates, and therefore I knew no trade. Tell me, said he, can you shoot with a bow? I replied that this had been one of the pastimes of my youth, and that doubtless with practice my skill would come back to me. Upon this he provided me with a bow and arrows, and mounting me with him upon his own elephant, took the way to a vast forest which lay far from the town. When we had reached the wildest part of it, we stopped, and my master said to me, This forest swarms with elephants. Hide yourself in this great tree and shoot at all that pass you. When you have succeeded in killing one, come and tell me. So saying, he gave me a supply of food and returned to the town, and I perched myself high up in the tree and kept watch. That night I saw nothing, but just after sunrise the next morning a large herd of elephants came crashing and trampling by. I lost no time in letting fly several arrows, and at last one of the great animals fell to the ground, dead, and the others retreated, leaving me free to come down from my hiding place and run back 
to tell my master of my success, for which I was praised and regaled with good things. Then we went back to the forest together and dug a mighty trench in which we buried the elephant I had killed, in order that when it became a skeleton, my master might return and secure its tusks. For two months I hunted thus, and no day passed without my securing an elephant. Of course, I did not always station myself in the same tree, but sometimes in one place, sometimes in another. One morning, as I watched the coming of the elephants, I was surprised to see that, instead of passing the tree I was in, as they usually did, they paused and completely surrounded it, trumpeting horribly and shaking the very ground with their heavy tread. And when I saw that their eyes were fixed upon me, I was terrified, and my arrows dropped from my trembling hand. I had indeed good reason for my terror, when, an instant later, the largest of the animals wound his trunk round the stem of my tree, and with one mighty effort tore it up by the roots, bringing me to the ground, entangled in its branches. I thought now that my last hour was surely come, but the huge creature, picking me up gently enough, set me upon its back, where I clung more dead than alive, and followed by the whole herd, turned and crashed off into the dense forest. It seemed to me a long time before I was once more set upon my feet by the elephant. And I stood as if in a dream, watching the herd, which turned and trampled off in another direction, and were soon hidden in the dense underwood. Then, recovering myself, I looked about me, and found that I was standing upon the side of a great hill, strewn as far as I could see on either hand with bones and tusks of elephants. This, then, must be the elephant's burying place, I said to myself, and they must have brought me here that I might cease to persecute them, seeing that I want nothing but their tusks, and here lie more than I could carry away in a lifetime. Whereupon I turned and made for the city as fast as I could go, not seeing a single elephant by the way, which convinced me that they had retired deeper into the forest to leave the way open to the ivory hill, and I did not know how sufficiently to admire their sagacity. After a day and a night I reached my master's house and was received by him with joyful surprise. Ah, poor Sinbad, he cried. I was wondering what could have become of you. When I went to the forest, I found the tree newly uprooted and the arrows lying beside it, and I feared I should never see you again. Pray tell me how you escaped death. I soon satisfied his curiosity, and the next day we went together to the Ivory Hill, and he was overjoyed to find that I had told him nothing but the truth. When we had loaded our elephant with as many tusks as it could carry and were on our way back to the city, he said, My brother, since I can no longer treat as a slave one who has enriched me thus, take your liberty and may heaven prosper you. I will no longer conceal from you that these wild elephants have killed numbers of our slaves every year. No matter what good advice we gave them, they were caught sooner or later. You alone have escaped the wiles of these animals, therefore you must be under the special protection of heaven. Now through you the whole town will be enriched without further loss of life. Therefore you shall not only receive your liberty, but I will also bestow a fortune upon you. To which I replied, Master, I thank you and wish you all prosperity. For myself, I only ask liberty to return to my own country. It is well, he answered. The monsoon will soon bring the ivory ships hither. Then I will send you on your way, with somewhat to pay your passage. So I stayed with him till the time of the monsoon, and every day we added to our store of ivory, till all his warehouses were overflowing with it. By this time the other merchants knew the secret but there was enough and to spare for all. When the ships at last arrived, my master himself chose the one in which I was to sail and put on board for me a great store of choice provisions, also ivory in abundance and all the costliest curiosities of the country, 
for which I could not thank him enough. And so we parted. I left the ship at the first port we came to, not feeling at ease upon the sea after all that had happened to me by reason of it, and having disposed of my ivory for much gold and bought many rare and costly presents. I loaded my pack animals and joined a caravan of merchants. Our journey was long and tedious, but I bore it patiently, reflecting that at least I had not to fear tempests, nor pirates, nor serpents, nor any of the other perils from which I had suffered before, and at length we reached Baghdad. My first care was to present myself before the caliph and give him an account of my embassy. He assured me that my long absence had disquieted him much, but he had nevertheless hoped for the best. As to my adventure among the elephants, he heard it with amazement, declaring that he would not have believed it had not my truthfulness been well known to him. By his orders, this story and the others I had told him were written by his scribes in letters of gold and laid up among his treasures. I took my leave of him, well satisfied with the honours and rewards he bestowed upon me, and since that time I have rested from my labours and given myself up wholly to my family and my friends. Thus Sinbad ended the story of his seventh and last voyage, and turning to Hinbad, he added, Well, my friend, and what do you think now? Have you ever heard of anyone who has suffered more or had more narrow escapes than I have? Is it not just that I should now enjoy a life of ease and tranquility? Hinbad drew near, and kissing his hand respectfully, replied, Sir, you have indeed known fearful perils. My troubles have been nothing compared to yours. Moreover, the generous use you make of your wealth proves that you deserve it. May you live long and happily in the enjoyment in it. Sinbad then gave him a hundred sequins, and henceforward counted him among his friends. Also, he caused him to give up his profession as a porter and to eat daily at his table, that he might all his life remember Sinbad the Sailor. Thank you for listening to The Seven Voyages of Sinbad the Sailor from the Arabian Nights by Andrew Lang. If you have enjoyed this audiobook, please consider subscribing and leaving a like to help in the making of future audiobooks.